Hi everybody, my name is Joey Fight. I'm the founder of thephysicaleducator.com and a physical education teacher here in Montreal, Canada. Welcome to today's episode of the Phys Ed Show vlog. Now today what I'm going to be doing is I'm going to be breaking down the qualitative rubrics that are at the heart of my assessment efforts, my Phys Ed learning roadmaps. But before we get into that, please make sure that you take a second to hit that subscribe button to make sure that you don't miss out on any future content that I put here on YouTube. I'm really excited about making videos again and I'm really excited to be sharing all kinds of new ideas with you. Also, I created a show notes blog post to complement everything that you're going to be learning here today. So you'll probably want to check that out on the physicaleducator.com's blog. Now that being said, let's get right into today's episode. So let's get in some real talk for a second. The reality is that a lot of phys ed teachers out there really don't know what they're doing when it comes to assessment. I know it sounds really harsh, but the reality is that I've met enough phys ed teachers, teachers with master's degrees in assessment, who are still assessing their students based off the terrible three, dressing out, effort, and participation in class. Now, I don't blame these teachers. Really, what it comes down to is that they just haven't received the professional development or the mentorship that they need to grow in that area of their teaching. But make no mistake, if we're going to elevate our profession, we need to build our capacity to use assessment in ways that is truly going to support our students' learning. Remember, our goal is to make sure that kids are developing the knowledge, the skills, the understandings that they'll need to continue to develop their physical literacy throughout their lifetime. And to do that, we need to make sure that they're learning and make no mistake, assessment is central to learning. Assessment is what allows you, both the teacher and the learner, to measure progress against a goal and then use that information to set new goals and determine next actions. Now, not only does assessment allow you to know where you're going, where you're at, and how you close the gap, it keeps you in that cycle as you continue to go deeper and deeper into your own learning. Now, one of the earliest challenges that we have as teachers is really truly understanding what it is that we're supposed to be assessing in the first place. Now, depending on where you live, you may have some government issued standards or competencies for physical education. And if you're really lucky, you even have those standards of competencies broken down into smaller grade level outcomes. As teachers, it's up to us to look at those grade level outcomes and unpack them to try and figure out the skills, the knowledge, the understandings that are all contained within them. This is super tedious work, okay? I'm not even fooling around here. It's tough work. However, it's so essential that you do it because then what happens is that you gain a clear understanding of what it is that you're actually trying to teach and assess. And it gives you the option then to ask yourself, what are the new behaviors that I'm going to be seeking out that are going to serve as evidence of learning that my students have actually mastered this content? That evidence of learning, those predetermined new behaviors that you've identified when you unpack your content, that will serve as the learning goals that you'll set in class and that you'll be measuring progress against as you assess your students throughout their learning. Now, here's the thing, though. Those goals need to be accessible to your students. Not only do they need to clearly understand what their destination is, they need to have some information on how to get there so that they can course correct throughout their journey. Imagine if I said I'm going for a hike to a cabin in the woods. All I know is that the cabin is 20 kilometers away and I just start hiking and I hike until I know that I've traveled 20 kilometers. There's no doubt that by the end of 20 kilometers, I've put in a ton of effort, but chances are I probably missed my destination and I'm somehow lost in the woods. Now imagine if at the outset I had a map and a compass given to me. What that allows me to do is that as I begin my hike, I can check in on with these tools and make sure that I'm adjusting my course so that I'm always moving closer and closer to my destination. Ongoing formative assessment serves exactly like that compass in the map. It helps your students make sure that they're keeping their learning on track. Even better is when the teacher takes that larger learning goal and breaks it down into smaller observable milestones. This creates this natural system where students are invited to check in on their learning on a regular basis, figure out where they're at, and then determine what ha needs to happen next in order to move their learning forward. In my teaching, I create learning roadmaps, these qualitative rubrics that I share with my students. And this is, it serves exactly that purpose. It helps my students understand what the learning journey can look like, figure out where they're at, and then determine what their next steps need to be. So the role of a learning roadmap is to try and help students understand what learning can look like throughout the learning journey. When I design my learning roadmaps, I do so by breaking them down into four milestone levels. The first level is the not yet level. This is supposed to represent what learners would look like at the very start of their learning journey. 
Now, the not yet level has this air of negativity around it because a lot of students think of it as being the place where you don't want to be. It's where you don't know, you can't do, you don't understand, and you're worse than all of your peers. Uh, but you can counter that as a teacher by putting in a ton of mindful effort to create this classroom culture where students understand that it's okay to start at the start and that it's actually really exciting to be there because now there's all this learning that you get to do. You're stepping into the Wild West, it's the final frontier, and, and that's freaking cool. Now, as students move out of the not yet level, they start getting into the getting there level. And this level is defined by some of those behaviors that you identified as evidence of learning they're starting to manifest themselves intentionally in class. They're not doing so super consistently yet, but you know that your students are intentionally trying to apply the things that they're learning in class. So that's really where you see that getting their level that they're, they're, they're beginning to understand, but they're not doing so super consistently yet, they're getting there. So the third level is got it. And this is where you see all those behaviors demonstrating or manifesting themselves in a very consistent, intentional kind of way. Students definitely know, they definitely understand, they definitely can do the things that you're working on in class, and they can do so in all kinds of different contexts, and they can do so on demand as well. It really defines what success is supposed to look like at that grade level. Now, for some students, they're going to get to got it really quickly, and those students are the ones who may be coming in with some prior experience, or maybe they're just naturally gifted at the thing that you're doing. And the danger is that if they achieve got it too early, they may become bored or they, they may grow off task or they may no longer feel challenged in class and that can cause all kinds of issues. So what you want to do is have that fourth level, the wow level, that really serves as a stretch goal for all of your students. Wow is supposed to be really, really difficult to achieve. Very few students in your class should be getting to that wow level. And it's hard to write the wow because you have to have a really clear understanding of what the whole learning journey looks like, and then understand the direction that you're gonna be moving in uh, for uh, next. So what I like to do is, what I'll do is that for the grade level outcome I'm working on, let's say I'm working with a grade six outcome, I'll look at that same outcome in grade seven, eight, and nine, so that I have a sense of the direction that they're supposed to be moving in, and then write my while based off of that. So those are the four levels that I create in my learning roadmaps. And for each level, for each outcome, what I like to do is select three student indicators, three student look fors that are going to define what that milestone looks like and help me understand exactly what it is that I'm looking for and help my students understand exactly what it is that they're trying to achieve. When I select these indicators, what I like to do is I try and make sure that I'm taking one that focuses on skill, one that focuses on knowledge, and one that focuses on understanding. I started doing this in my teaching because I felt that it was a more fair way of assessing my students. Listen, some kids will come into class and they can do the thing right off the bat. They can do it right away, but they don't know how they're doing it and they don't really understand how they're doing it. Other students might come in and they might develop that knowledge and that understanding, but given the short amount of time that you have in phys ed class, they don't necessarily have the practice time that they need to really truly fully master it. That being said, the reason I selected that skill, that knowledge, that understanding focus for my indicators is I wanted to make sure that I was assessing my students not only based off what they're doing right now, but what they'll be able to achieve later on in the future. So by assessing not only the skills, but also the knowledge piece and the understanding piece, I get a much more global view in terms of how well my students are mastering the content that we're working on in class. And this has really, really served my students and it really motivates my students as well because they understand that just because they can't do the thing yet, they shouldn't lose all motivation because they're starting to build that understanding, they're starting to build that knowledge base, and they know that they just can't do it yet. But with practice and time, they'll be able to get there because they have all the pieces in place. Now, aside from wanting to be as holistic as possible in my assessment, there's another reason why I always select three student indicators per outcome that I'm assessing. And it has to do with how I produce my grades in phys ed. Earlier this year, I decided to completely revamp my student grade scale to make sure that when I give a student a grade, it's really easy for them to understand how that grade came to be. And it's also really easy for me to communicate that to their parents, to my administrators, or any other stakeholders who may be interested. Here's the thing. I'm not a big fan of grades. I actually hate grades and I'm obligated to give them because it's part of my job. That said, grades do serve a purpose. They're supposed to mark progress towards mastery and that marker then lets you decide exactly what you can be doing to continue to make progress as you move forward. 
by having the grade scale available to my students like this and by showcasing exactly how their grades came to be, it just makes it easier for them to make sense of their grades and it makes the grades a little bit more meaningful to them. Now here's the thing, this is not the focus of this video and I could be going on about this for a long time. So what I'll do is I'll let you learn all about it on your own by checking out my Meaningful Grades blog post over on thephysicaledgecare.com. Okay, so how about I show you exactly how I design my learning roadmaps by designing a learning roadmap with you right now. For the purpose of this example, I'll be using outcome S2.M5.6 from Shape America's National Standards and Grade Level Outcomes document, which states that students should be able to reduce open space by not allowing the catch, so denial, or by allowing the catch but not the return pass, which is actually one of the outcomes I build my grade six invasion games units around. So before I get into this, I just wanna say that if you wanna learn more about standards-based physical education and how to design units and lessons that are aligned to standards, be sure to check out my Phys Ed U course on standards-based instructional design. In it, I go through everything about this process from unpacking standards to determining the evidence of learning, selecting or designing the appropriate assessment tools, designing your learning activities and sequencing everything together. I also provide you with a ton of links, a ton of resources, and some free downloads that are gonna make sure that you build up that capacity to bring standards-based instruction to your teaching. If you wanna learn more about my Phys Ed U course or sign up for the course, you can check it all out at thephysicaledgecare.com slash you. Okay, let's get back to this learning roadmap. So the first thing I'm gonna do here is I'm going to take a look at that grade level outcome and I'm gonna break it down into smaller content blocks. Then what I'll do is I'll take a look at each content block and ask myself, what are the skills, the knowledge, the understandings that a student would need to demonstrate to show me that they've really mastered this content? Doing this is gonna allow me to break those content blocks down into smaller learning pieces. Now you'll notice that I'm using MindNode here, which is a mind mapping app. And I think it's just perfect when you're doing your unpacking process because it really allows you to just keep going deeper and deeper and deeper into your reflection of the grade level outcome. Once I've gone through that whole process, what I'll do then is I'll be able to identify all the knowledge and skills and understandings are packed within that grade level outcome. And I'll take a step back and I'll look at it globally to start to decide what my student indicators are going to be. So with all of this laid out in front of me, I'm gonna have a really cool global view of everything. And I'm gonna start asking myself, okay, what are those three levels of indicators I'm looking for? The skill focus, the knowledge focus, and the understanding focus. I'm also going to limit myself though to three for each grade level outcome because what happens is that if you draw, try and do too much, you wind up never really being able to go deep into anything. And you're probably not gonna teach all the things that you've laid out anyways. You may just skim the surface. So what I like to do is I like to limit myself and just make sure that I'm doing um, the most important things and then just go as deep as possible into those things when I'm actually teaching. So for this outcome, the three student indicators that I've selected are, I can quickly transition between on the ball and denial defense in response to who is in possession of the ball. I can describe both on the ball and denial defense in my own words. And I can understand how to space myself from the player I'm guarding based on where the ball is. So I chose these three indicators because when I took that global look at all the content that I unpacked from the grade level outcome, the big idea I got from it is that what I really want is my students to understand when to switch between on the ball, denial, and help defense, and also how to play all three defensive positions effectively in game situations. Now with that big idea, what I'll do is I'll actually rewrite the language from the grade level outcome. If you watched my vlog on student learning targets, you'll know that the grade level outcome language is written for teachers and it's up to us to digest it and then um, reframe it for our students so that it's accessible to them. So the big idea that I came up with for my students is I can play both on the ball and denial defense in invasion games. So those three levels are what defines the got it level that I'm gonna put into my learning roadmap. So I'm gonna go do that right now, uh, right into this template that I created on my computer. And by the way, you can get access to this template for free um, on the website, just check the show notes and I'll put a link in there. So with my got it level defined, what I'll do next is that I'll look at that first student indicator and then move backwards and check out what would it look like at the getting there level. So I like to work backwards because I find that it helps me really break down that got it level to a place where it would make sense from a student who is starting at that not yet level. Once the getting there level is done, I'll then continue to move backwards and move to the not yet level. This level is usually pretty simple, basically gets summed up as I can't do or I don't know whatever the indicator is at the got it level, followed up with yet at the end of the statement. 
With the first three milestones mapped out, that's when I look at everything across the spectrum and ask myself what could be considered a wow for this indicator. Again, this level has to stretch your student's learning. So it has to be really challenging for a student to be able to get to wow. So really take the time to think about what would that next level look like and what would somebody who is going above and beyond their grade level be able to do nor understand in class. So once that first indicator is all mapped out across all four milestone levels, I'll then work with the next two indicators that I selected. And then my whole grade level outcome has been mapped out across the entire learning roadmap. From there, I'll just continue to map out any other grade level outcomes that I've decided to build this unit around. So again, just FYI, I try and limit myself to a maximum of two or three grade level outcomes per unit that I teach. Doing more than that means that you're trying to look at over 20 student indicators and that's just not feasible in the amount of time that you have in physical education class for most people. I don't know. I don't know where you teach. I don't know what your reality is like. But for me, it's just not feasible. I tried. I failed miserably. Remember, it's better to do less and achieve more. Do less. Go deep. Achieve more. That's the rule you want to follow when it comes to this. So that's how I designed my learning roadmaps, which are an absolutely essential piece to all of my assessment efforts. Listen, we need to be putting more emphasis on assessment in physical education. It's absolutely crucial to the learning process. If we're not taking assessment seriously, how can we call ourselves teachers in, within the schools that we work? I know it's a lot of work and I know it can be really tedious, but taking the time to really think about what it is that you're assessing and how you're going to assess it just gives everything you do in class so much more meaning and purpose. And it really, 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 truly benefits your students. So take the time build that capacity, boost up that confidence, and go out and assess your learners. So that's it for today's episode of the Phys Ed Show vlog. Once again, my name is Joey Fight from thephysicaleducator.com. If you found that this episode was useful to you, if you felt like you learned something, please make sure to take a second to like, share, and subscribe. All right, I really enjoy making content, and you taking the time to get the word out to more people just helps us elevate the bar for our profession even faster. If you want to learn more about designing learning roadmaps, please make sure you check out the show notes, which I'll link in the description below. There's also all kinds of other information that I'll link to in those show notes that you can already find on thephysicaleducator.com. Thank you so much for watching this episode. Have an awesome week and happy teaching.